Welcome to another episode of Our Interesting Times. It's my pleasure to have Jay Dyer back on the show. Jay, uh, well, Jay, how you doing? Doing great, Tim. Always glad to be on Our Interesting Times because our times are interesting. Very interesting in the worst kind of a way. And, of course, you are the proprietor of Jay's Analysis, jaysanalysis.com. You're the mm-hmm. author of Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbolism in Film. And I understand you are taping a very uh, important series of, tel- I guess, television shows for the Guide Network. Been very busy, so I'm very appreciative of your time with me tonight. Thank you. Um, and uh, so I guess you're finishing up the, uh, later on this week with those? For the uh, season? Thank you for those kind words. Yeah, we've, we've finished 11 episodes, and we'll finish uh, six, 17 or 18 uh, by the end of this week. And, um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of really, really cool stuff. Uh, movie a movie analysis kind of Cisco and Eber style show that really doesn't exist. I don't think there's another Cisco Ebert style show that that does film analysis, you know, the way that I do it, and it kind of linked up well with the, the style of Jay Weidner, the way he does film analysis. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have a, we have a good chemistry, a good rapport, so we kind of just go back and forth and give our thoughts and and, and impressions of these seminal films and shows and kind of dissect them, you know, and it, and it ties in well with uh, Dave McGowan's work, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about tonight. And we referenced, you know, Dave quite a bit, um, you know, my work kind of builds on that as well as Michael Hoffman's work too. Mm-hmm. So, so it's, it's going to be neat. It's, it's going to be, I think very high quality. It's not, it's not stupid. It's not fluffy. It's going to be pretty hardcore, uh, but it'll also be a lot of, uh, satire and comedy and you know joking around hopefully too they may edit out all my, my jokes. <laughs> maybe like I, they sounded like they were laughing in the uh, control room but i couldn't tell so maybe uh maybe they're laughing at how bad it was so, i don't know i hope my impersonations you know don't get edited out but they may end up on the cutting room floor I don't know. <laughs> uh what i'm oh, sorry what's the name of that show it'll be called hollywood decoded Hollywood Decoded, okay, and that's going to air on the on the Gaia Network, and people, I guess, subscribe to that, to yeah, that network? Yeah, it'll have to be uh, by subscription, but um, as I understand, you know, this is, it's a anywhere streaming service, and um, it's also on some cat- uh, cable and satellite, so if you have Amazon Prime and that kind of stuff, you can get it too, so. Um, oh, excellent, I do, okay, so I can watch yeah, it, okay. It, it should that's be on cool. all those, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm cool. pretty sure that's right. I'm pretty sure Amazon has Gaia, but um, may need to check on that. But uh, but yeah, so it, it will, we've got uh, some of the some good stuff lined up for season one. We've got uh, David Lynch, and we've got some Kubrick, and we've got some um, Ridley Scott, Blade Runner, and the uh, Alien franchise, and um, some X Files. Uh, so there, there's a there's a good lineup, and then. A lot more to come, you know. If this does well, we'll do another, another two seasons on top of that. So, great. And um, of course, a lot of those movies I do after watching or listening, reading your analysis, or listening to your analysis. You can go re- rewatch the, some of those movies that may seem a little strange, particularly David Lynch films. And uh, you can really th- those your analysis really helps. And thank sing, you. Yeah, a lot of this, people have been yeah. saying that. They say when they get the book, they kind of read my book and then they they watch the movie and then read the chapter and watch the movie. So it's you know it ends up being kind of a fun fun thing. And uh, I think the show will be too because uh, we have a, we have clips that we're playing too. So it's not just sitting you know me sitting there talking with with Jay Weidner. It's also uh, you know important sections of the film and, and yeah, look, yeah, you know the images and the scenes and, and what's going on. So. Your analysis of Ernest Goes to Camp is particularly enlightening. There was, <laughs> I wrote that as a joke, and then I had people who did, they didn't think it was a joke, and they were like, "Do you really think this is about this?" And, I, and it says satire on there. It's tagged under satire. Okay, it's great. And of course, um, uh, listeners uh, here, if you want to uh, support Jay regularly, you can support his uh, website for uh, four nine ninety five a month, sixty dollars a year. That's the regular thing. Support his research. Um, okay, well, tonight uh, you did a uh, an excellent analysis of Dave McGowan's uh, program to kill. I th- uh, we've talked touched on it before in mm-hmm. the past in our previous talks. I think our first conversation we talked a lot about that, uh, but just touched on it. And t- you did a uh, almost a two hour analysis of it. Um, and um, of course, I-, I wanted to talk about that in light of the um, maybe uh, Michael Hoffman's. Uh, 
analysis of the serial killer phenomenon, particularly the, the ritualistic aspect of it and the alchemical mm -hmm. process that it, that he, he believes it's invo that's involved with it. And right. the broader issue of uh, sort of the societal degradation and debasement that occurred in the 1960s and 70s into the 80s, of course, in the context of the Vietnam War, uh, the uh, development of feminism and all the psychological warfare that the American people had been were being have been sub subjected to since the Second World War. So, uh, hey, how do you want how do you want to dive into it? Well, um, I guess I could point out that in my own experience, uh, you know, I, I didn't grow up during that period. I grew up in the '80s, so I didn't know much about that era except through my dad my dad was into led zeppelin and the doors and you know he would always play those albums and that was really the only experience i had of it until i you know got to be older and started reading and getting into history and trying to make sense of what had been happening especially in the united states and then i think in my 20s about 24 or 5 i read uh, Hoffman's book and, and that, that was a a big uh, piece of the puzzle for me it was a big awakening stage for me I think I've got it my that, that's secret my societies copy, psychological warfare yeah. okay my copy is dated 2006 so and he really opened up I guess a new way to look at things uh, in and in, in a broad way uh, so he's he's really tying in the ideas of Hollywood and uh, mass culture, pop culture with the military industrial complex and with secret societies and the occult and, you know, how the Pentagon uses psychological warfare and uh, ritual crimes and, and, and how it all kind of connects. And so I think he's maybe one of the, the best figures that you could point to that kind of laid out a more coherent unified field theory of conspiracy because you know, I think prior to, I mean, maybe you could find somebody, I don't know, but I mean, when I think back to conspiracy texts written prior to 2001, which is when he published his book, you know, you would get books that might deal with a certain topic, like, you know, there would be books on the Templars, and there would be a book on the Masons, and then, you know, it's very limited subject matter, uh, but I think Hoffman's book is a step towards meta-analysis, where he's really trying to put all these pieces together and, and he ties in, you know, the theological aspects too, like making sense of uh, what happened in the Catholic church and, and uh, at Vatican two and beyond. And it just made a lot more sense, I think. And so um, I was, and I was a, a traditional Roman Catholic at the time attending the Latin mass and so forth. So, so Hoffman had a big impact on me. Um, and then I realized that, he was kind of the, the first person I read that did kind of an esoteric movie analysis. <laughs> so he kind of gave me the idea or, or I, I got the idea to do that style from, from his analysis of uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, he wrote a, a book on, or an essay on that a long time ago. That's kind of famous. Um, so, so it's just, it's a great all around book introduction. I, it's usually what I tell people who are new to the topic to read as an introduction. Um, <clears throat> and, I mean, it, I, I'm not sure where to start with it just because he talks about so many things, too. Um, but Dave's book is a great companion to that book because they're kind of in the same vein. They, they do overlap at times, uh, even though the focus of Program to Kill is more just on ritual crime. He's not really dealing with uh, you know theology or, or history, per se. Uh, but one of the things that Dave starts out with that really impressed me in his book was that he it looks like he read most of the material that's published dealing with, you know, MK Ultra and mind control. Uh, so, you know, there's Jose Delgado's uh, physical control of the mind and there's Donald Bain's control of Kenny Jones and Walter Bowart's book, Operation Mind Control and John Marx's book. And I've read a lot of these, but I haven't read all of them, but I've read a lot of these too. And so, you know, Hoffman's book kind of kicked me off on that, uh, 11 or 12 years ago. And then uh, I read uh, Jay Stevens book, storming heaven, which is also uh, kind of along the same path as weird scenes inside the Canyon, but not a little more watered down, a little more mainstream. Um, and I read that a long time ago and that kind of got me thinking, you know, that maybe a lot of what we were told about the sixties counter 
culture revolution was not what was really going on and that maybe that wasn't real. And I had my own experiences of going to concerts and, you know, being around so-called hippies and, and the people of that counterculture mindset, because, you know, you start noticing as you get older that it's really just different costumes and dressings that people are wearing who are being counterculture. Right. So it's like mm -hmm. the counterculture of my, my period when I was, you know, 18, 19, it was Nirvana. It was Pearl jam. It was alternative music. It was, um, you know, that was just the next phase of the, the cultural dressing. Um, and you start to realize that a lot of this stuff is not organic. It's actually top down. It's, it's corporate. It's, um, it's sold. Uh, and that's, it runs contrary to what the whole ethos is, is that it's supposed to be an organic counterculture movement. And then I think, you know, I just, as you get older, you, you read more and you learn more and you realize that, uh, you know, the, the people who run society are not idiots. They're, they're very adept and they're masters of the scientific, scientific process and scientific technique of uh, mass psychology. Uh, so I know I, I would even still recommend probably Jim Keats book, uh, uh, mass control. It's a, it's a good introduction to this topic and it, it fits well with Michael's Hoffman's book and, uh, and Dave McGowan's book. But anyway, just to kind of set the stage, you know, I just started diving into all these books and, you know, there, there really is a dearth of evidence to suggest that, uh, wait, is that the right word? I'm kind of, I'm kind of tired. I'm on a <laughs> dearth is dearth. Uh, excess no, or, no, dearth would be a, 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 lack, a lack of or ending of. Okay. Yeah. There is uh, an excess, excuse me, an abundance an abundance of evidence right, to, <laughs> to suggest that um, that the the counterculture movements are essentially you know engineered, and that's that's the main point here. Uh, and and you say, well, how could that be? Why would that be? Well, when you look at what the Pentagon was studying, what the military was studying back into the 30s, 40s, and 50s, what the advertising agencies were studying, and it was mass psychology, mass sociology, uh, and the mind of man. And if you could master the mind of man, then you could master the, ma the mass mind. Uh, and so all of these studies and, and all this research that the establishment put into uh, mind control and, and physical control of the mind and all this kind of stuff, uh, it, it manifested itself in all these very bizarre things. Like, uh, you know, one of the in culture doctors, Dr. Jolian West, gives a whole bunch of LSD to elephants just to see what it'll, what it'll do. Uh, and you can go on on um, YouTube and still see a lot of these this old archive footage of some of these uh, Stanford research experiments too, where they're giving giving LSD to all these animals and monkeys and and uh, seeing what it does. And uh, we well, can watch the spider webs that were created by spiders that were given LSD and how they're all messed up and <laughs> their webs don't work. And uh, so I mean they really perfected I think the the chemical approach to biological warfare is what this amounts to. And that's why it was classed or eventually under biological warfare. So, so that's what uh, impressed me about Dave's book and uh, having now read a lot of these books that he references, uh, I think I have a better, a much better picture of how the, 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 the studies of multiple personality slash disassociative identity disorder was of central import along with hypnotism uh, for for so many decades, and I, th I think that you could argue that this is probably perfected. And of course, you know, Colin Ross has a lot of lectures and books that deal with the same topics too. Um, so I think there's definitely something to this. Now, there's a lot of disinformation that says that there's no such thing as uh, you know fractured personalities and this kind of stuff. But uh, I mean, it, ma it makes a lot more sense if if this is true. Um, now I've had my own experiences with LSD uh, when I was 17. So I know firsthand what happens. Uh, I had a bad trip the first time I did it. And so I understand the, the potentials and how it can cause uh, multiple or, or fractured personality. Now, I mean, I don't think that I have alternate personalities or anything like that, but what I'm saying is that I know the process of what happens in throughout the, the acid trip. So I, I can see how, these kinds of things occur. 
Uh, and if you read John Marx's book, he talks about that too. He talks about how they had actually studied the, the, the trip process uh, and how it could cause dissociation. Uh, and then you get these popularizers, right, who go out into the pop culture who sell it, like Tim, Timothy Leary. Uh, now, Timothy Leary attaches all this esoteric stuff to it. And this is where you get the whole idea of promoting uh, the archaic revival and, and indigenous religious traditions and all this kind of stuff attached to LSD and the promotion of hallucinogens. And uh, I don't think we need to rehearse the Henry Luce time. We all know that. Yeah, yeah. Time, uh, 1957 time. Right. Life magazine, yeah. You've done plenty of interviews on that. And uh, so, you know, you, you start to notice all these things and all these these uh, puzzle pieces that just don't make sense to be a counterculture revolution. You know, and of course, that's the, that's the thesis of uh, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. Uh, you know, and, and I think he argues well in there that that's our culture movement to whatever degrees, maybe the anti-war movement, you know, was a uh, organic and legitimate was eventually taken over and turned into just kind of this Dionysian base passion type of thing where, you know, Jim Morrison's up there like having sex with the speaker on the stage while he's bombed out of his mind on drugs. Right. It just turns mm-hmm. into, turns into total, uh, total chaos basically. And, and, and this chaos and dissociation, I think you can see it reflected in the artwork that was promoted like Jackson Pollock and Andy Warhol and, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, CIA uh, aided characters, uh, these uh, Frankfurt school type characters. And, and so to boil it all down, I mean, you really have, it's, it's what Adorno talked about, you know, from the Frankfurt school that, that if you uh, promote inversion and, and uh, perversion, you could really destroy the social order. And these wackos of these sickos, really believe that you had to destroy the social order to to fix things so that's that's i think the setting for for the 60s it was a whole bunch of things it was psychological warfare it was a lot of large-scale testing of cults of alternative lifestyles quote unquote you you've uh you know you've done talks with uh, with john adams i've done interviews with john adams and he talks a lot about how california was kind of set up to be this mecca for the for the alternative lifestyle, uh, you know, as, as well as promoting kind of the uh, Silicon Valley uh, military industrial complex aerospace stuff, you know, up towards Sacramento. Uh, you know, if you didn't like that, you could go down to L.A. or, or San Francisco or Haight-Ashbury or something and get involved in whatever cult you wanted. Right. So it'd be, mm-hmm. it's really you just have this cornucopia of um, test tubes, I think, going on throughout the 60s. And uh, I think that LSD was given on a mass scale on purpose. I think that was by design. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you look into the history of the drug war, you start to realize why that would be very plausible, especially given the importation of uh, cocaine and crack for, you know, the black neighborhoods and stuff like that. We figure out that that's all true. Uh, so it just makes more, it, it makes a lot more sense that the culture is controlled and, and studied and created uh, much more than it is, you know, any kind of organic process. And uh, so that's, the setting that's the zeitgeist for both Hoffman's book and Dave McGowan's book. Yeah. So you have uh, in program to kill and now, the way it's structured is he introduces the book first with, uh, with, with uh, organized elite pedophilia, the, the, uh, the pediocracy, yeah. I think. And he's, I think the first 80 or 90 pages talks about the Mark Dutroux affair and these various exposure of, of pedophilic networks. Um, and we all, I mean, just in recent news and just in our research, uh, alternative research into the deep state and some of the intrigues of the intelligence agencies, the function that that serves, that child, that human trafficking, particularly mm-hmm. with blackmail and uh, and uh, and, right. uh, and human compromise. Um, well, what's interesting, too, is that both of these books, you know, Hoffman's book was written in 2001 and uh, Dave's book is written in 2004. And here we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's 2017 and I, yeah, I had Hoffman's book a long time ago and I would give this book out. People would call me crazy. They would hand it back to me. They'd be like, I read the first chapter here. Take this back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure Dave's, I'm sure Dave's book was received the same way. Uh, I only read, you know, program to kill fairly recently, but yeah, but the point, my point is just that look at how much of this has been vindicated, you know, in the last mm-hmm. few years. So these are mm-hmm. prescient books. 
Uh, and for me, you know, I mean, I don't want to be vindicated on this awful dark stuff, but, uh, you know, it makes me realize that I, I'm not actually crazy. So all the, all the people who, you know, called me nuts uh, over the last uh, 15 years or whatever. Oh, I get that. I say when people call, someone calls me crazy, I just say, no, you're just ignorant. Yeah. Then they get offended. Well, you just called me nuts, which is worse. <laughs> like, yeah, right. I mean, like, just, you just don't understand what you, they don't you know understand. What I, I, I'm not mean, I don't, I don't, right. I don't mean to be arrogant, but I mean, 99% of the time when I, when people are operating that way, they've not read any of this stuff. No, so they're they, they, don't, they don't have any working knowledge of this material. So, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's some, and you, you're, you, you don't have the patience or the predilection to be tutored on this stuff. So I'm not going to waste my time. <laughs> right. You know, just uh, do the research, come back in five years, and then we'll talk about it. Um, and that's what it takes. There's no, that's the problem is there's no substitute for for understanding these things other than just doing the research, reading the material, and thinking about it. And also holding out that, the, you know, there are some, some of these things that I – there's nothing wrong with saying I don't know. I'm, I don't know for sure, you know. There's a, a, a bias against um, – there's a bias towards certainty. And some of these things we don't have certainty uh, with. We have to uh, infer, have to you know, con- uh, speculate uh, based on, on the on the information we have, you know. And that's only natural. I don't know what people expect. They they, they create an usually high standard, um, and it's selective mm-hmm. too, because they'll they'll accept the narratives and other things without any without any evidence, or just because they're told something, you know, because Walter Cronkite told them something, or they're you know, or yes, Brian they, Williams. They, there's a brilliant, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, There's sorry. a brilliant, brilliant point that Dave makes in the program to kill at one point where he says, you know, we're supposed to believe that the CIA never really got anywhere with MKUltra. It didn't really teach them anything about mind control and how to brainwash people. And, uh, you know, they just kind of let this go after the hearings and all the stuff. However, we are at the same time supposed to believe from the official sources uh, that all of these cult leaders have perfected the process of mind <laughs> yes. control, right? So it's David a double Koresh think, yeah. Jim Jones, you know, David Koresh and Jim Jones are masters of mind control, but uh, the CIA and Pentagon, they just don't have a clue on it. Yeah, with an unlimited budget and technology yeah. at their disposal. Um, um, yeah, that's. I mean, that was the uh, the subtext or the uh, the argument of Charles Manson's uh, conviction. He makes this very point: is the uh, assumption of mind control on the part of Charles Manson. Because mm-hmm. uh, he apparently, uh, you know, the the the, the killers uh, went out, uh, you know, and performed the massacres, uh, and they were convicted. But they're, 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 they we were to understand that they were they were uh, they were controlled zombies. And at the mm-hmm. same time, Charles Manson, who according to the official narrative was never at any any of the scenes, was convicted. Right, and so it makes no sense. <laughs> Uh, from a legal standpoint, well, uh, yet, yet they did it, you know. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. And um, you know, I I, I just like the uh, the approach because you know Dave's willing to he's willing to look at the arguments of the skeptics, and the, one of the problems is that you know skeptics who say that there's not any substance to disassociative identity disorder or to any of this stuff is that they generally don't take into account all of the abundance of, for example, the material in Dave's book, right? So mm-hmm. so you, you'll get these people who try to debunk things, but they never deal with, you know, like the totality of the 350 pages of, the, of this book. You know, what, what, what about all this, right? I mean, it's, I, I mean, I can, I, I understand people being skeptical and certainly, not every time somebody claims something, it's true, uh, but that's not a sound argument to debunk the whole idea of, you know, maybe we don't under, understand everything about the psyche. Uh, you know, that I've done a lot of reading and a lot of research into that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that the so-called establishment really understands or knows the, the, what the psyche, I mean, they might have perfected a lot of techniques when it comes to entrainment and, and psychic driving and these different, you know, mind control techniques. But that doesn't mean that they really know what they're dealing with because, uh, you know, St. Paul says the, who knows uh, the spirit of, who knows the soul of a man, but the spirit which is in him. Right. So mm-hmm. e- even our, our souls and our spirits are somewhat mysterious even to us. 
so I don't think the establishment has every everything locked down on on what man is or what man's soul is, precisely because most of these people have uh, completely naturalistic presuppositions, so they don't they don't think there is a soul. Uh, so you know this is why everything's treated with chemicals and so forth. But anyway, you know he he just provides a bunch of arguments for uh, you know people in the establishment even saying there's more going on here. These people aren't faking. You can look at experiments through through hypnotism. You know, hypnotism has been stu- studied for 80 years. So, you know, obviously they've made some kind of progress there. Freud talks about ritual abuse. And then you have, you know, the suspicious, obviously suspicious fact of the false memory uh, syndrome foundation being founded by these CIA people who are involved in things like child trafficking and child porn and stuff. That's right. It's uh, what's his name of? Uh... What was his name? It was a Martin Orn or something. He was yeah, Orn. That's, that's right. <laughs> Orn, who was MK Ultra like, scientist. Oh yeah, he worked uh, in. Yeah, that's right. He worked in <laughs> like, okay. Colin Ross has a good bunch of stuff on that. But uh, yeah, I think wasn't also Jolly West involved with them too. That sounds right. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> False Memory Foundation. Now, for a point of clarification, um, Dave McGowan's thesis. Uh, well. In program to kill, and also it it, it dovetails, or it's a good follow up to um to his um, or actually preceded it, but um to his Laurel Canyon book because mm-hmm. in Laurel Canyon he he, he points out that the uh, this uh, dizzying array of the popular some of the most popular uh, uh, musical bands of the 1960s having connections to military and intelligence, with the theory that the uh, music itself was weaponized for the purposes of culture creation and sort of steering the culture in a certain direction, undermining the anti-war movement, uh, mm-hmm. the manipulation of the youth culture, the creation of the youth culture, which preceded it by a decade, I think, in the early 50s. Um, in Program to Kill, he says, um, he provides, he puts forth, the, puts forth the theory that the arrival of the serial killer phenomenon on the American landscape wasn't an organic uh, development or an accidental development, calm, uh, coming out of America's post-war, um, you know, uh, yeah. environment of prosperity, uh, youth culture, a sexual revolution. This was a plan, uh, this was a, um, a weaponized system, like sort of a domestic application of the Phoenix program. Right. Uh, and also a, an attempt to maybe an a, a update or a modification of Murder Incorporated to uh, carry out a certain amount of hits and, you know, and also an attempt to shape the culture, to create a culture of fear to uh, sort of uh, expand or uh, the, the then burgeoning police state. Um, mm-hmm. SWAT teams, uh, FBI, Quantico, uh, Quantico Lab and all this stuff and the justification of budget. So that's, that's, his, that's the thesis of the book. Is that, is that how you, you see his argument? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, um, yeah, the majority of the book is, is made up of the – the serial killing crimes and ritual crimes. Uh, and then you do have, like you said, those, those kind of early chapters that dealt with more of the sex crimes and mm-hmm. pedophiles. But, uh, you know, one of the themes that he mentions is that a lot of these, these people seem to have been uh, known by the establishment, a lot of these uh, deviants. And so the idea here is that because a lot of these people who were troubled, uh, maybe they were brought up in, very severely dysfunctional homes and then maybe they were molested and then having been through the system they would have been fingered and and earmarked as potential candidates for these kinds of things now that's very scary and that's very uh, daunting uh but uh, it, when we think about all the other material that's out there uh, for example the way that uh, dr ewan cameron was stationed at uh, mount royale psychiatric institute in canada uh that's precisely what he was doing he was finding troubled people in the psych wards to run his tests on uh when we think about other uh, aspects of the mk ultra program that were run through various universities and uh human ecology foundation uh, or through these fronts these psychiatric fronts uh they were also working in prisons uh, like in louisville kentucky excuse me lexington kentucky i think uh, was one of the sites where they were picking out prisoners, according to John Marx's book. So that dovetails well with Dave's thesis, which is just that you ha- if you've grown up in the system, you know, with somebody like Charles Manson, you know, he's a great example. Who's, you know, he was in juvenile 
problems from like day one, right? Uh, so, so he would have been known to the system is what is what we're trying to say here, and that a lot of these guys seem to have a curious pattern of where they end up, and the serial killers tend to be, <clears throat> excuse me, tend to have these time periods where they they spent a good bit of of time in uh, California, Texas, and Florida. <clears throat> excuse me, and so Dave kind of theorizes that uh, what you have is in these states is number one they're they're kind of ob- obviously military industrial complex type states especially with a lot of the uh, the bases in california and then you have uh, a lot of drug running that would be related to the the texas mexico border uh and then obviously uh, drug running to uh, from waterways uh you know into florida so Mm -hmm. so that that requires a lot of deep state apparatus in other words uh, to to keep the the drug situation flowing and when you have one black market like drugs you oftentimes have the other ones too like human trafficking uh so drugs and human trafficking requires sometimes threats and hitmen and the the serial killer phenomenon then can have many uses, right? So you mentioned those in, in your description. Uh, but, of course, Dave also mentions the possibilities of unsolved murders. Uh, these can be uh, haystacked, I think is the term that you've used, where police departments, or excuse me, uh, the haystacking is where you, uh, you, you have a target, uh, but you sort of, blend them in amongst a whole bunch of people that you've that you've killed so it appears random mm-hmm. so that's another one of the, the theses here uh, and then you also have the notion like you said of haystack or uh, of uh, you know police departments kind of stacking these onto one guy oh Henry really Luke has killed you know 200 people or whatever which seems, seems a little bit uh, Im- implausible yeah they took um, him on a tour he went on and said I did that one yeah I did that one yeah, yeah, yeah that was me too <laughs> Uh, but I think okay. it's fascinating too that uh, you know he tends to mention with these characters that they they could have been picked out because they had disassociative identity disorder, uh, and that may not necessarily mean that they were like programmed in the sense of uh, uh, you know, like sent on the mission to do this. Now they may have been in some cases, but rather that that they would have been chosen as people who already had mental problems is what I'm trying to say. So, and it, the, so, uh, so words, psych- that would be yeah. that would be the cover, right? They would never be suspected for being used by the establishment or some nefarious group, precisely because they're crazy. Yeah, and the reason I mean the suspicion that 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 sort of um, uh, uh, identification process was in place. Well, uh, with MK Ultra, the psycho- psychiatric profession was completely taken over. By mm-hmm. the military and intelligence for the purposes of doing just that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, a uh, good example. You mentioned obviously you and Cameron up in um, up in Canada, uh, and he was funded by the Human Ecology Fund, the CIA. I mean, this goes back. Mm-hmm. Was it George Estabrooks, World War Two? Right. Uh, you've over in the UK, you have the Tavistock Institute, which identified you know right. shell shock and trauma and how it could be weaponized and manipulated. PTSD, yeah, yeah, PTSD, and the various. Uh, I think I think every prominent psychiatric hospital institution was some way or another involved with MK Ultra back in the 60s, 50s and sixties. Uh, same with the, yes. like you mentioned the prisons, Vacaville, uh, the there was a, mm-hmm. uh, Angola prison in, in mm-hmm. Louisiana, and you, yeah, you mentioned the one in, in, in Kentucky. Um, so that's been established. <laughs> so that's, I mean, the, the, all the, some of the big, the, the heavy hitters in, in, in psychiatry and psychology were part of MK Ultra, And so that sort Absolutely. of reporting mechanism would be there. Yeah. F- just for that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And, uh, even the, even the public information is, uh, over 40, uh, universities, uh, and institutions like that were involved. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and that would include, I'm assuming, universities that we probably would like, you know, it would be some of the obvious ones like Stanford and uh, Harvard. You know, the, uh, Ted Kaczynski was part of the MK Ultra project uh, in yeah, Harvard. Yeah, that's right. And I think uh, his victims were connected to SRI. Yeah, okay. If if the official narrative is has any truth to it. Uh, right. Which is, which is interesting. 
I mean, <laughs> uh, so uh, he's he was a MK Ultra, MK Ultra test subject or victim. Uh, by so, the way, just a little aside here. Have you seen Spellbound? With uh, with with Gregory Peck, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it years ago with Ingrid Bergman. Years, all the Freudianism. I thought it was hilarious in it. Well, it, it is Freudianism, but what's interesting mm-hmm. is that uh, if you go back and watch it, uh, Gregory Peck is being used as the uh, he what the there's a doctor at the institute who's framing Gregory Peck for murder. That's right. He's doing that because Gregory Peck has disassociative identity disorder and he can't remember what he's done. Uh, and mm. so I was like, this is like in the forties and I was watching this the other day. I was like, man, this is kind of like an analogy for a lot of the MK Ultra type stuff. This fits well with, with David McGowan's book because this guy believes that he's committed the murder and uh, it was actually the, the head of the uh, psych- psychiatric institute. Yeah, that's the one with all the Salvador Dali art in it. Correct. Yes, it has <laughs> yeah, that yeah. surrealist, uh, yeah. all seeing, all seeing eye uh, um, artwork. And I think it was George Esterbrook. He was the world during World War II was talking about mind control mm-hmm. and hypnosis and trauma to create um, disasso- use dis- disassociative disorder or multiple personalities to correct. Yeah, the, well, the yeah. essay "Hypnosis Comes of Age," which is the most famous one that you can read. This was a it's online, and, and it's the 1971 or two Science Digest essay that he wrote, and that's where he kind of lays out his, his bragging about, oh, I can do. I mean, I, I think the essay is older than 1971, but it's that's where you'll find it online, uh, is in that that format. But uh, yeah, that's where he describes the process of hypnosis and the courier and the keywords and the triggers mm-hmm. and all that. And so, did you? Um... Uh, catch my interview with Dr. Joseph Farrell recently on um, on Common Core. I did, yeah. And the, he he's made a well in that interview and also in several and in the book, of course, he connected uh, the electronic testing service. Yes. To the Human Ecology Fund. Mm-hmm. I did hear that. And, and when you're talking about you're you're talking how these guys could be identified, profiled as you know through. The various because they're identified as being psychological. Well, you problems. have the standardized testing, exactly. Standardized testing, yeah. And so now, and of course, that was all done at the behest. I mean, they they contacted. I think it was uh, Conant. I think at Harvard who ran it or something. I forget the name right. If I remember, but basically, right. it was it's done to not just to identify you know the best and the brightest or to sort of to um, channel people into, into the professions they think people should do based on their testing parameters or standards, or whatever. Um, but you could uh, this you talk about today. I mean, talk about what the military does with video games, right? This interactive mm-hmm. video games that go to the Pentagon, <laughs> first shooter games. These things being monitored. Yeah, yeah. come be yeah. the drone pilot and yeah, kill everybody at the wedding. Yeah. Um, so these people can be identified like that. Um, yeah. So it, I was imagining the technology is far more advanced now, just with uh, obviously with the internet and with our uh, smart devices everywhere and everything being monitored, what we read, what we buy, our habits being mount- monitored digitally. And mm-hmm. that could, uh, fl- you know, that could flag, you know, certain, you, you could get flagged. And, okay, here we go. We, we got somebody. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. Yeah, so let's exactly. go, That's a good you point. Know. Um, so again, it's one that you, people hear this stuff and says, no, I mean, the, 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 the literature, the history is there and it's been acknowledged uh, that these, that, this was done, and again, the uh, all the universities, all the psychiatric hospitals, these prisons, these institutions uh, right. that are supposed to help us protect society were weaponized, uh, for, you know, to, to do uh, to uh, do something quite opposite of what you know, what their public uh, charter claims they're there to do. And if anybody um, doubts that, all you have to do is read the works of Bertrand Russell to understand the scientific outlook, mm-hmm. uh, because it's it's ruthless. It's not moral. They don't have any qualms of using people in that way. Mm-hmm. And, of course, in the book, he, he just goes through a list of, of, of these serial killers. They all, well, not all of them, but almost <laughs> military intelligence backgrounds, um, uh, yeah, Vietnam experience. Right, yeah. And that's yeah. where we get, would get the, the potential Phoenix connection. But I thought it was interesting that uh, I, I didn't actually know a whole lot about Henry, Henry Lee Lucas. Uh, but you know, he, he points out a lot of suspicious things, like being pardoned by W. Yeah, 
he's he's a good man. Henry Lucas, good boy. He's a good boy. Right. Like, and, but so he claims that he was in a satanic cult, though. No, so I don't know if it's true, but that's what Henry, Henry Lucas claimed that the hand of death cult, you used him and that he was a contract killer and that this was associated with uh, human trafficking in, from Juarez into uh, presumably El Paso or Brownsville or somewhere. Uh, and this, of course, connects to the death cult MS-13, which is the Latin American gang that's <clears throat> you know, connected to all this kind of stuff. And I, I believe is, uh, has to have some kind of help from above. I don't mean God, I mean from <laughs> above, from the, the government. Um, especially with, if, if, because I've watched some documentaries on uh, Santa Muerte, which is the cult which a lot of the MS-13 are into. And you look at the guys who run this cult, and it's, they're just totally shady, obviously involved in some kind of, some kind of thing, um, and that's that jives well with a lot of what Dave claims in the Henry Lee Lucas chapter. And you know, this is where we—he's he, a good example of kind of the archetype of what his thesis is, because Henry was Office of uh, Naval Intelligence, or had some connection there, or he was spotted there, and maybe he uh, there's some connection to NATO. I'm looking back at the at the book here. Careful screening of subjects was accomplished by the Navy psychologists and the military records. Many were convicted murderers serving prison sentences, and they were put into this program. Yeah, here we go. So he's arguing that uh, in Chapter 8 that uh, Henry, Henry Lee Lucas was probably one of these these people in this kind of a program. And, and the military is ruthless. You have to understand that, too. Like, they're just as ruthless as the, the scientism of Bertrand Russell. Like, they don't have any qualms of, I mean, they're in the business of killing people. They, they weaponize everything. Right. So, yeah. you know, yeah. to a lot of people, this is, just sounds so, you know, well, we're American. We wouldn't do that. You know, the, the we have the Wounded Warrior Project. We go back and grab our wound, wounded men. <laughs> we carry them back. <laughs> right. Uh, but no, that's not really, I mean, uh, obviously a lot of people in the military are good natured and would do that. But, but that doesn't mean that that's the modus operandi of the total totality of the military. I mean, there's. You know, it's compartmentalized. There's all kinds of secret projects and stuff like this. And so, you know, D Dave just kind of lists a whole bunch of these <laughs> characters that's, that seem to pop up around the same time. And you have uh, Berkowitz and you have, uh, uh, I think he mentions Jim Jones or in some capacity. I don't know that Jim Jones was necessarily uh, a military connection, although we know that he had the connection to Dan Mitrione, who was the CIA guy. Down in was it Paraguay? Paraguay? Yeah. yeah. yeah he Hello. Was... You, can you hear me? You're, you're getting really. Hello. Really, you're cutting up really bad. Oh really? How about yeah. now? No, it's just super staticky. Okay, let me give you. Let me give you a call back. Okay. Now clear it up. Thanks. All right. Uh, so. Um, yeah. So. I think uh, this uh, chapter eight is one of the one of the more important chapters in the book because this is where he's talking about. They're called CTs, uh, criminal. I don't know what that stands for, but uh, these are the people who are in the Phoenix program, and they're they're the ones that are trained to. They're kind of profiled to be the psychos, and then they're kind of let loose. Obviously, the, the under the auspices of psychological terror against the Viet Cong, and then these people come back, and you know they're already known to the military, so they could be put to all kinds of use, right? And that's that's a a very enticing theory i think because yeah, what do you do with these men once they come back yeah what do you do with these guys right and um yeah. so anyway that's that's um i'm flipping through the the chapter so that that was a really important chapter and um i didn't know anything about the matamoros cult that was totally new to me i'd heard of it but that was new to me and then and so you just realize that there's so many examples of this stuff that it's kind of just been forgotten in in the you know in, in the news like i remember, remember this back in the 80s or 90s or whenever it was, uh, but in the 80s. Uh, but, you know, we were told that there was, uh, that was all a satanic panic created by Geraldo. Mm -hmm. right? There was no real Satanism. There was none of this. It was just a panic. Uh, yet, uh, uh, throughout the 80s and 90s, the Juarez was the world capital for missing women. And I actually went and looked up a lot of Dave's 
claims and articles on this, uh, only because I had traveled last summer to California and stopped in El Paso on the way, and I saw Juarez, and uh, it made me think of the movie Sicario, and I was thinking, good grief, <laughs> it just looks so awful over at Juarez. And uh, in Sicario, the, the story is that the FBI girl is tricked into working uh, with this military attache. She's attache for a military outfit that's run by the CIA. And she thinks that she's going to take out a, um, a drug dealer assassin. And really all that, that what, what was happening was that the CIA was taking out a rival drug dealer. Yeah. Uh, and so she, they duped the, the FBI girl anyway. <clears throat> so that all takes place in Juarez in the, in the movie. <clears throat> And I'm sitting here reading this this chapter in Dave's book, and I'm like, this is straight out of, this sounds just like uh, Sicario. Uh, and, you know, it's not hard to believe. I mean, if you go and you, you know, you look at the border wall there in El Paso, and you look over into Juarez, it just looks like a, it looks like a hellhole. Well, you, they got to keep it a hellhole because it's also a good source of cheap labor for the... Uh, well, that's what Dave said, points out, too, yeah. is that uh, this is a big part of NAFTA, was being able to move all the... Uh, uh, sweatshops there, uh, but you know he he argues that there's a lot more going on, uh, that it's not just sweatshops that you know the, the women are going missing for a reason. So, yeah, well, yeah, that Rancho Diablo, which is an interesting name for a ranch. Yes, that comes up in here too. Right? Yeah, and that, that's is that the one that's connected to the Matamoros? Uh huh. And they yeah. uh, there was raided by the Texas Rangers eventually. Yes, and, exactly. And they found bones all over the place. And again, for year people. Ignored it for years. That's uh, just a, a, a rumor. It's a, it's a myth. Um, and I think that's the one that Henry Lucas talked about, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and it is. Henry Lucas is an interesting story because you know, he's supposed to be the serial killer. Of course, he teamed up with two, three different people at, at a time. Uh, one of his Ot- partners, Otis Tool, Otis Tool, who um, uh, uh, has been linked to the uh, the death of Adam Walsh, and everyone knows, you know the. Uh, 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 most want. What's that show on Fox? Uh, not most wanted. What was it? Uh, Walsh. He had that show on Fox News. America. America's most, most wanted. wanted. <clears throat> um, of course, that was in 1981. His son went missing in a Sears and a Roebuck in 1981, and the boy's head was found floating in the canal. Otis Tool was was uh, taken in for questioning for that crime, and the police, at the time, lost. The machete, and even the, the I believe even the automobile that he had used, and they let wow. him go, and he, and he was in prison again later on, and he uh, supposedly confessed to that crime. Um, mm-hmm. And if you know, I've you're probably too young to remember, but I remember that very well because that was one of these national stories. We started getting national stories in the '80s about missing kids. We didn't get those in the '70s. It was always regional, mm-hmm. um, and it. He was went on Phil Donahue show and all this, and you know, be, it became a crusade about missing and exploited children. And of course, the, the the fact that the head was separated, you know, suggests some sort of maybe a satanic thing. But right. this gets into this, uh, the sort of the alchemical, uh, I guess, element of the serial killer phenomenon that Michael Hoffman gets into. But even uh, Dave McGowan talks about it, creating fear, uh, creating an atomized society where kids can no mm-hmm. longer go out and play, communities no longer cohere. Um, this, this, just getting it after like that would terrify the community, and it, it was it was it was a trauma for the entire nation. The way the media covered it, and um, what's strange is, of course, uh, this Jeb Bush, the governor of Florida, who Otis Tools arrested, <laughs> George, so the governor of Texas. Um, mm-hmm. But you again in all these cases, whether it's the same thing with John Wayne Gacy, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, Otis Tool, is uh, inexplicable complete uh, police incompetence. The uh, failure to follow up on things, and um, that's what he points out, you know. Yeah, and this comes uh, <clears throat> to the fore, uh, especially in the case of um, oh, my mind just went blank. I watched the after I read the book, I, I watched the a four hour TV movie about. Oh, that was on John Wayne Gacy with Brian Dennehy. Yes, yeah, with Dennehy, right? And yeah, so here he he's uh, essentially it, now that the, the TV show, movie, the TV movie kind of hints at it, but not really. They don't go into the fact that he was seems to have been operating very well with the local police mm-hmm. 
you know, as, as if maybe he was maybe their guy, you know what I mean? Like their guy to take out people. Because if, if there was a, a gay prostitution slash drug ring, then presumably in that kind of a setting, you're going to be worried about narcs. Uh, and so, you know, you might need to have somebody around to take out the narcs. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I don't know if that's exactly what was going on with, uh, with him, but, but I mean, that makes, that makes sense in terms of the police incompetence and the fact that he was this uh, very prominent member of the community and the JCs and, you know, all these civic organizations that he was a part of. He, uh, Dave McGann makes a point in the book. He talks about the whole idea of the serial killer profile. He says, most Americans are probably familiar with what is considered the classic serial killer profile. This was the notion for, for, uh, first put forth by the venerable FBI, which coined the term serial killer, and pioneered the concept of profiling in an alleged attempt to understand the phenomenon of the mass murder. It appears to be the case, though, that the concept of the serial killer profile was put forth to largely misinform the public. And if you scrutinize these cases, uh, one can't help but agree with the Mr. McGowan on that point. Because none of them, like the bind, bind, torture, and kill killer, uh, uh, none of his, none of his supposed kills follow any profile. And that's one. Yeah, of, that's a right. case of haystacking potentially. Because uh, yeah. one of his first kills was this military guy who uh, <laughs> told his son that someone's after him. And the whole family was wiped out. His wife, who was trained in martial arts, two dogs, I think, were killed. Another son and him. Right. And, and Dave makes the argument that uh, it looks a lot more like a, uh, a special operations trained person. <laughs> yeah. You know, came in and, and did this as opposed to, you know, this weird, creepy guy that's just kind of, you know, stalking around the neighborhood, you know, like like we're, what we're told it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, the um, you, know, you, you, you met in your talk. You talked about the Zodiac Killer, mm-hmm. you know, and how, of course, how again, uh, well, there's a boot that was identified as being a, 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 a Navy issue or something, right, right. So it's military, yeah. and I guess that seems that there again that that seems to be a case where there are a lot of people doing it, similar yeah, with, more, similar to Son of Sam, people. yeah. Right. Yeah, like Berkowitz said, and then Berkowitz says, "Oh, I was at the working at the behest of a larger satanic cult." The uh, of course, the Son of Sam case came on later. That was the the seventies, and um, Maury Terry's book posited the theory that uh, it was a cult doing it, and he just right. Berkowitz himself said he was only at two of the shootings, right? Um, and um, it, Ho- Michael Hoffman sort of examines that case and talking about. Um, all the evidence suggesting that it was indeed multiple, you know, perpetrators. Uh, well, one of the points, exactly, one of the yeah. points of uh, Oliver Stone slash Quentin Tarantino's movie, Natural Born Killers, is, is, is that the media is really what creates and, and gives everybody the impression of the serial killer. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm not... I don't know how cognizant they were of Dave's book, but I'm saying, or Dave's word, because I think that that, book, that movie came out when I was in high school. But but the point of the movie is that the, the media makes these people into stars. It, may, it makes uh, their media creations, is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that once again shows the role of uh, mass media in terms of psyops, because you know if, if Dave's thesis is right, then... The, that's why we don't see them anymore. They're not needed anymore. <laughs> this, mm-hmm. this, where did all the serial killers go? Where are they? Yeah, the work. The work's been done. I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, it, the getting into the the uh, why this you look at when the serial killer emerged. I guess the late sixties. I think the Zodiac Killer was probably. We're at you at the the Salvo, the Boston Strangler. Mm. Another, another case where if, none of the uh, doesn't fit any of the profile. In fact. <laughs> People think he went to prison for his being the Boston Strangler. He didn't. He went. He was convicted for another crime, and I think it was mm-hmm. weird. Is F. Lee Bailey was his lawyer who presented the strange defense that he that he was not innocent, not guilty of the crime he was charged because he was busy strangling somebody. I think that was his defense. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but DeSalvo himself looks like some sort of mind control victim. Um, again, there's only there was no age. 
women of all ages. Uh, there's no profile to it. Um, and it's just one of these weird cases. Um, oh, by the way, uh, Ted Bundy also is one of, uh, says claims that there were other people involved. Yeah. So that it was it wasn't just him as the lone, lone gunner. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing. You remember he's able to break out of prison and kill mul- multiple girls at a sorority. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's like how does he? <laughs> oh, he breaks out of prison and is able. To... Same thing. Richard Speck. Remember his case? And uh, he broke into the nurse's dorm or something, and was able to murder multiple girls uh-huh. as, as they waited. I mean, they were like locked in a room and waited. Uh, Interesting. Uh, one I by remember, one. But I don't yeah. remember the detail, but uh, I remember you, you, you noticed this coming up too. Uh, Richard Ramirez's case, he, he seems to have been trained by his relative who was a military killer of some sort. Yeah. In Viet- he was in Vietnam. His, his, yeah. his, I think his cousin or yeah, older cousin brother or something. Yeah. Uh, Richard and Ramirez. then, uh, Bobby Joe Long is the cousin of Henry Lee Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> That's all, the, all in the family. That is unbelievable, um, yeah. But uh, look at the context of when this is happening. Is it, We're talking about the 1960s, the Vietnam War, and what the Vietnam War represented. Uh, a lot of motivations for that war uh, wasn't the domino theory. Um, you know, Obviously, one was uh, big war contracts, mil- a lot of spending, uh, Kellogg, Brown, and Root, a lot of harbors to be dredged, a lot of helicopters get shot down and maintained and replaced and these things. Another, another uh, motivation for the war, of course, was heroin. We've talked about that. Um, but another one, I think with Chris, when I talked to Chris Milligan, he comes up with the theory that the war itself was intended as a trauma for society, it's society to kind of create a divide between generations. Yes. And this gets just goes into the, you know, the broader th- a theory behind the counterculture and in order to get the counterculture you needed a war to protest and uh, so um, the overall t- uh, trauma of that war of course within that war uh, the war itself provided a great um, opportunity not only to experience uh, I mean to test various weapons weapon systems weapon platforms but also psychological warfare of course Doug, Doug Valentine's work on the Phoenix program is invaluable in understanding the Phoenix program what his intent was was to um, it's a counterinsurgency program to uh, destroy what was referred to as the civilian infrastructure of the Viet Cong. Of course, what that really means is <laughs> on the ground is killing a lot of innocent people, torturing a lot of people, terrorizing them. It's what you see in Apocalypse Now. You know? Yes, yeah, and uh, yeah, and that's of course created by William Colby mm-hmm. uh, and. Um, Oh, I just lost my train of thought. I was going to say. Um, well, uh, the, the implication is that um, if, in order to subdue the civilian population of Vietnam to achieve whatever objective the the U.S. government had in Vietnam at the time. Oh um, yeah. Go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. You had, I remember now. So okay. uh, yeah, what you start to notice is that the uh, these operations that run for foreign psychological operations. Uh, this is what I've been noticing the last couple of years, especially when you study the phenomena of the color revolutions and uh, Arab Spring and, and then all that kind of stuff. And then you also look at the School of the Americas and the death squads. And then mm-hmm. you start to realize that, that the foreign ops are kind of test tubes. And then maybe it looks like at times they'll they'll bring that back home and do it mm-hmm. domestically. So it's not this is a pattern, I guess, that's been going on for a long time is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and it's an attempt to destabilize, and of course, you're going to destabilize Honduras or El Salvador or Peru or Chile in a different way that you you destabilize you know Springfield, America, you know, mm-hmm. Los Angeles. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the idea of the Phoenix program, obviously, things like the um, I don't know Department of Homeland Security uh, grew out of uh, the uh, the Phoenix program. The ideas before it, you know, the basic idea, of these, the whole idea. Of of, um, of fusion centers is an adaptation of the Phoenix program to to, um, to modern oh, okay. people. So yeah. all these things, so these things don't go away. They're you know they're you know they're tested and they're modified. Um, but the idea of um, perhaps uh, destabilizing the the home front for for a particular reason 
uh, for some sort of, as Michael Hoffman would say, some sort of al- alchemical process, so sort of to debase, to degrade, to break yeah. down, to atomize civilization, right. I mean, the, the community. And obviously you get that with the fear of crime and the serial killer. Um, the um, He talks about it. Uh, yeah, of if course. I recall, Ma- that's, that's Negredo, the blackening. There you go. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Exactly. There you go. Of course, many serial murders are nothing more than the work of a single individual acting out a graphic horror movie he saw or responding to a powerful psychotic impulse, impulse for aggression and predation. But many other serial murders involve the cult, a cult protected by the U.S. government and the corporate media with strong ties to the police. These murders, you know, obviously you're citing like John Wayne Gacy, there's evidence of that. These murders mm-hmm. are actually in- intricately choreographed rituals performed first on, on a very intimate and secret scale among the initiates themselves in order to program them, then on a grand scale, amplified incalculably, incalculably by the electronic media. You like natural born killers, right? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, you know, so there you go. And this is what gets in the end what we have is a highly symbolic ritual working broadcast to millions of people, a satanic inversion, a black mass where the pews are filled by the entire nation and through which humanity is paganized, brutalized and, and debased in this negredo phase of alchemical process. You know, I was right. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. You're right. Yeah. So um I'm impressed you remembered that. Um yeah. Uh, and um well, I, I can see reading that if you're just like an average Joe, you know, who just – what is this guy talking about? Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, and you see that in Berkowitz. You see that in in, uh, in Bundy. You see it in John Wayne Gacy and all these things. Um, all yeah, he's back to Jack the, Jack the Ripper. He, yeah, Jack the Ripper. As, uh, 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 he chases back to – I forget who the guy's – Lord Gall, I think, or what was his name? Uh, so. Yeah, one of these like high level British Mason guys. Freemason abortionist, yeah. Yeah. Um and the point is and he makes the point in, in psychological warfare and secret societies, secret societies and psychological warfare, is uh this sort of process won't work in a society that's healthy. So the society has to be broken down bit by yeah. bit gradually. Uh where uh if the society gets brutalized in our brutalized enough and degraded enough, then it does work because a healthy society will have a natural uh, uh, defense mechanism for these things. Yes, uh, the, yeah. uh, he uses the term theater cruelty. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the whole nation or the whole society becomes like the horror movie and it's intended to brutalize. Uh, and that, that kind of goes, it's, it's a trauma-based mind control on a mass scale. And so da- in Dave's book, he talks about the blooding he's I'd, I'd never heard it called that i've just always heard people say you know people that are severely disturbed like these uh, killers uh you know they're, they're just traumatized but he calls it a blooding that at a certain point in their lives when they're younger they're intentionally exposed to the macabre and to something bloody or, or traumatic do you, do you remember what i'm talking about yeah 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 exactly yeah like, you know, they're 16 and they get a job at a morgue or something. You know? <laughs> and they're like dealing with cadavers and then, you know, weird stuff's going on. And, uh, you know, this is, I'm not saying that it's everybody who is a mortician's evil. I'm just saying that in the cases of these people, he, he's noted that as a, a, a consistent pattern that, you know, they, they had some sort of uh, grotesque. Uh, exposure, you know, that that scarred them, I guess, in some way at a, at a formative period in their life. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he makes the point what this, what these, uh, tr- what this trauma creates is. Um, he says it's a uh, w- what we observe in the population today are the three destructive symptoms of persons whose minds are controlled by alien forces. I guess what it means by that is the psychological warfare. Uh, amnesia, i.e. loss of memory, abulia, loss of will, and apathy, loss of interest in the events vital to one's own health and survival. Amnesia, abulia, and apathy are nearly universal among us today and gaining a greater foothold each passing day. Um, this, And this is done, again, th- through the electronic media, through entertainment. He even talks about, um, well, breads and circuses and the effects yeah, of, you know. that Negredo process... Uh, it's uh, page 67, that may have been where you were reading, but he says, in the end, we have a highly symbolic ritual broadcast to millions of people, a satanic inversion, a black mass where the pews are filled with the entire nation. Mm-hmm. 
uh, the Negredo phase. And then he goes on to say, the French adept Antonin Artaud, architect of the theater of cruelty, wrote about this in terms of the group mind. Aside from trifling witchcraft of country sorcerers, there are tricks of global hoodoo <laughs> mm-hmm. in which all alerted consciousness participate periodically. That is how the strange forces are aroused and transported to the astral vault, to that dark dome. Now, this all sounds kind of crazy, but what the guy's saying is that when you have a huge event, like the whole nation's fixated on Manson or the whole nation's fixated on uh, Zodiac or 9-11, that it's understood that you can reason from the individual to the, the collective. So if you have an individual who is traumatized because he's fixated on, you know, the, the, the shock that happened, that you can do that same process on a mass scale through having everybody's energy and focus, you know, and attention on, you know, whatever this gigantic, so-called crime is zodiac mm-hmm. or manson or whatever and that what that does is then that everybody's participating in this process of being uh, being ritualized you're you're being you're going through the ritual process i've written a bunch of articles on how yeah. mass media is like a ritual process but but anyway that's that's what hoffman's saying is that just just hammering home that point that that i've been arguing too that you can you can reason from the individual to the from the micro to the macro scale to understand and that's exactly what they did with mk ultra is they expanded the the individual studies to the mass you know yeah with the same not just through the uh, uh with drug distribution and also with uh meat mass media and psychological warfare exactly right yeah yeah um yeah here's the part I, I, he says it much better than i said he says uh Talking about, he's talking about revelation of the method and talking about why would they reveal what they're doing? What, what, how would that serve the the, uh, the interest of the cryptocracy? He says, why would the mm-hmm. perpetrators want their secrets revealed after the fact, even if it is years later? The question, sorry, the my volume, the question can only be definitively answered if one has an understanding of the zeitgeist which overseers in the cryptocracy have partly manufactured and partly tailored their own operations to coincide with. As I've pointed out, secrets like this were rarely revealed in the past because traditional people had yet had not yet completed the alchemical processing. Uh, to make such perverse modern revelations to an unprocessed, healthy, vigorous population, possessed of will, memory, adherence to their deepest inner intuition and interest in, intense interest in their own salvation, would not have been a good thing for the cryptocracy. It would have proved fatal to them. But to reveal it after the acts of secret I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. You were right. But to reveal it, you know, pretty much after they've been processed. Um, I lost my quote there. Oh, well, basically, to reveal it later after they've been processed, they ha- they can't respond to it. And they they fall into that what he was talking about: loss of will, loss of memory, and uh, and 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 apathy. And they they can then be, uh, you know, they can, they can then be manipulated. Yeah, it's like the hypnotist yeah. uh, with the victim there, you know, like Svengali. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. He's like, uh, this is the government of Svengali, and you're the beautiful young maiden, you know, yeah. in the population. <laughs> exactly. The, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, but again, what you and we're talking again. What, what's going on again? It's what's, why this would go. It's the serial killer would come on the scene in the late sixties in the height of the Vietnam War. And going into the 70s, you have the economic crisis of the 1970s, the closing of the gold window, the end of Bretton Woods, um, the debasement of the dollars, and it co- coincides with also the cultural debasement of the of the American people. Um, the uh, this feminism, uh, the promotion of, of perversion like gay rights through Planned Parenthood, these things. This is turning society upside down and making everyone confused. The mm-hmm. d- The... Uh, targeting of things like the family that was uh, that occurred would also lead to further degradation and also uh, for, further trauma, which would complete the process, which we're seeing now. The confusion we're seeing. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Know. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the the alchemical process includes the period or the stage of androgyny, um, and that's ultimately the the meaning of the Baphomet symbol. Mm-hmm. Baphomet is, is androgynous, has both genders. 
And if you listen to a lot of interviews with these people who are really into this trans stuff, and I'm speaking kind of across the, the board, like if they're into transhumanism or uh, trans, maybe, well, maybe transvestite, but I've, there's a, there's some pop culture so-called icons who I've uh, watched documentaries on who talk about the, their their beliefs and why they wanted to change their genders, like this weirdo Genesis P. Orridge, who's a kind of a punk figure, post-punk or whatever you call it just makes noise. The guy's mentally unstable, obviously. Um, but he went through the gender process or to some degree, gender change, excuse me, reassignment, whatever. And, uh, he's, he goes into it and he starts talking about alchemy. He says, well, I'm a fervent believer in alchemy. And I believe that in the original state of whatever the divine was or, or whatever we evolved from, that it was neither male nor female or, or in some cases, They'll actually say they believe that it was female that we we all evolved from like a some sort of feminine uh, primal cell. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so you get all the, in other words, it's all based on nonsense. It's all based on myths and uh, gnostic fables. But they will say that since and this is in Neoplatonism too, and Platonism, the, the original unity could not have any distinctions or particularities. It couldn't have masculinity or femininity so it had to be that that has to be the the state that we got to get back to right and this fits all into the the stuff that huxley talks about openly so you have to we have to get rid of distinctions the the enemy of the 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 future will be distinctions distinct nations distinct genders distinct races distinct religion distinct claims all that has to be destroyed in the name of unity and globalism Uh, that's literally what huxley says so uh, they are aware of alchemy. In fact, I think even Kessler in Ghost of the Machine talks about the whole process as alchemy. And, and you say, well, there are scientists that don't believe in medieval alchemy. Well, it's those are just terms for the same process, right? So if you, you know, if you take, if you're taking genetically modified, if you're if you're taking a fish scale and putting it into a tomato to make the tomatoes skin stronger against pesticides, you're not doing anything different than what a medieval alchemist wanted to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he just didn't have the, the means to do it or the technology to do it, but that's at least what he was trying to do was, you know, mess up creation and whatnot. Uh, and that's really what alchemy is, is just the, the, the attempt to, um, it's the, Domination of nature through techne, uh, ultimately at the chemical biological level. Uh, that's that's what I read alchemy as. So, yeah, I mean, there's all this kind of spiritual stuff that people try to tack on to it. Of John D would say, "Oh, I, I can turn uh, base matter into God. You can become God through my uh, alchemical steps and Enochian magic." But I think a lot of that stuff just they were just con men. Uh, you know, alchemy is is more so chemistry. That's what it, it, beco- it eventually becomes is the, uh, is chemistry. But, but what is so fascinating is that even if we deride or laugh at the notion of alchemy, you know, what the establishment is doing, what genetics research is doing, what bioengineering is doing, what geoengineering is doing is actually, you know, creating the, the monstrosities that the alchemists talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not, not literal. Well, I don't know what they actually do in cloning labs. Who knows what they're doing? But when we look at, you know, synomics and we look at the aborted fetal cells being used for the uh, flavoring in Pepsi and for the uh, vaccines, which is all true. You know, that that's alchemy. That's dark alchemy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, you also made it interesting because in, in your talk, uh, you, you talk about serial killers and uh, Michael Hoff made a point that basically it's the promotion of thanatosis, so the cult of death that's mm-hmm. being promoted in all this. Um, uh, and you, you mentioned, uh, well, women with multiple abortions mm-hmm. and how sort of the... That's never uh, mentioned as psychopathy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he, he makes... It's very funny because in psychological warfare, secret society in psychological warfare, uh, he says... Um, 
Of course, no matter what her affiliations, Sharon Tate's murder was a heinous crime. It is interesting to note that while much is made of the murder of her unborn baby as being the most horrible part of the Mason gang's uh, occult violence, women who pay physicians to kill their unborn babies are not regarded as guilty of any sat satanic act, heinous or otherwise. Was the sacrifice of Sharon Tate's unborn baby somehow a ritual pre precursor for the coming mass sacrifice of unborn mm. children, which was subsequently right. legalized by the United States Supreme Court? Uh, so this was August 1979. Of course, we're over to January 1973. Um, uh, that was an uh, interesting point. <laughs> it <laughs> is, was, yeah. yeah. And think about, and here we are now with Kurt Gosnell. Mm -hmm. Gods like that. So, yeah. so I mean, people, people might balk at the idea of ritual and in uh, power behind these kinds of acts, but <clears throat> if you. Uh, I'm not saying that shamanism is true. I, obviously, I don't believe in shamanism, but if you read the approach that shamans have or the, the how they go about their process of understanding the world and their ritual process and all that, even though I think they're totally wrong, in a way, it's a, a perhaps, spiritually speaking, a little more uh, closer to the mark because they understand that you know, they're they're tapping into entities on the other side, and we would laugh at that, balk at that in modern America, and we think that that's so superstitious and stupid. But uh, you know, there, there are many many indigenous uh, tribes and, and shamans out there in the world, and there many of them still take hallucinogens. Uh, this is being promoted in our country. I've had bad experiences on hallucinogens, so I, I know directly that you know you're tampering with the psyche and your tampering with your spirit. And that's a dangerous road to go down. And I also think that the LSD was a big part of it, that that just as the shaman goes through an initiation, the promotion of LSD, I think, was a kind of uh, ritual process because, again, in, in when uh, Gordon Wasson and, uh, you know, these characters went and, and got the ergots for the creation of LSD, mm -hmm at the Sandoz Pharmaceutical Cor Corporation, they were also aware of what the shamans were able to do when, when the shamans would initiate people. So you cannot divorce these drugs from that process, even though, even though we tend to think of them as divorced from it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we're just partying, we're just hanging out. And I'm saying that, no, there's an actual power behind these things that's very dangerous. And that's why so many people go crazy and, uh, you know, jump out of buildings and plunging to their death. And, uh, you know, see, you know, they, they get lost in other realms in their mind. They're crazy. Uh, you know, all that stuff happens for, for a reason because this is very dangerous. And I, basically what I'm saying is that it's satanic is what I'm trying to say. Well, now, I'm, not what, saying, yeah. I'm not saying that drugs in themselves are always bad. Obviously, nothing that God created in itself is evil. Uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, the, the mass promotion of these things and the pharmaceutical usage of these things, I think, generally speaking, is not for human well-being. Yeah, well, that's if you look at the how many college students, I think, uh, John Rappaport did think, uh, had a, an article talking about how 25% of college students are receiving psych psychiatric care. Yes, like, um, and this and they're being dying, and they're given you know psych, uh, psychotropic drugs to deal with their problems. Mm -hmm. When you know anyone looking at why a, a freshman or a sophomore in college might having might have living problems because they're away from home for the first time, not doing well. Maybe they received a bad educa poor education in high school. Maybe I don't know. Maybe the, you know they're feeling guilty because they're hooking up too much. Maybe they're you know <laughs> all mm -hmm. types of things uh, that have nothing to do with uh, that can that can be dealt with through pharmacology yeah. uh, but the schools themselves have become uh, not only uh, uh, instruments for uh, for debt bondage you know predatory loan institutions but they've also become a mass mind control operation not just through just, just through you know, poor education or indoctrination but through drugs apparently right right yeah. um, I did a I, I would recommend people to I did an essay or an article, I don't know, four or five years ago, but uh, I, I can't remember the name of the title, something like Masculine 
feminine wisdom or something like that. And it's about the drug experience. And I'm actually arguing against the, the, the use of hallucinogens because I see them as such a spiritual danger. Mm-hmm. But see, nobody, nobody talks about them as a spiritual danger. And that's what's very surprising to me because you can watch the BBC uh, documentaries, a whole series of this guy, Bruce Perry, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. And he just totally, really stupid on his part, went and found like 12, 10 or 12 different indigenous tribes. And he went through the ritual process of all of these tribes to be initiated in. And most of them involved uh, the usage of hallucinogens and pretty heavy toxins at times. And, uh, you know, he describes this process too. And he real, he eventually came to the realization that it was all, it was, uh, it, it couldn't really be divorced from its spiritual, uh, significance. Uh, and for, and it ended up being a bad thing for him. Like he, he felt like, like he had to go ha- get, uh, like psychiatric help eventually after he had done all this. Which is completely stupid. I mean, I can't. Yeah, going can't back believe, to the... <laughs> I mean, Assuming that he really did all this, that it wasn't like a BBC put on or something. But yeah. Assuming yeah. he really did this, you know, he had to get psychiatric help, and you know, he had he had uh, experienced too much dark stuff. Uh, but you know, I I swear on it that it's real. You will uh, you will encounter uh, dark thing. Not every time. Not every single person. I can't speak for it because it's it's more of a like you kind of take this inner journey and you're kind of forced to deal with the uh, issues that you have. Now, some people think that that's a positive thing and that psychology should utilize these things. I don't think it is. I think that's a trick. Uh, I think it's totally dark. Uh, You look at the history of the church, for example, when the church would do its missionary work and they would find these indigenous tribes and so forth that that were doing this. It's almost always the same thing. Like the, the shamans who are, have been blasted their mind on these drugs and try to control the people through these drugs. Uh, they, they're not, th- these are not healthy people. We have this mistaken assumption, uh, that, Oh, all, all the innocent, the noble savage, right. Of, of uh, Rousseau or something. Mm-hmm. That's not true. <laughs> these people yeah. uh, are not uh, the noble savages. Um, so that, that all needs to be, I think debunked. And, uh, who's the woman who did the, uh, um, the famous uh, anthropologist who Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead, yeah, her stuff was debunked too. That she was, yeah, she of course she was a spouse of Gregory Bateson, who was an- weaponized anthropology. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yes. it was all done to yeah. exploit primitive people. Then the only problem is they look at us as primitive. The general public is primitive, being for being manipulated. Uh, I a while back I interviewed uh, Dr. Hans Uter, and we were talking about um, well, yeah, this, I heard it very thing actually and he, he he's talking about you and Cameron and his some of you and Cameron's research over there at the Alamo Memorial Institute was to see if psychosis could be um, well uh, uh, could spread like a disease like a contagion mm-hmm. and um, well it's interesting because like anything if it could uh, <laughs> under the pretext of trying to contain the contagion they we- like a bioweapon they'd, they'd seek to weaponize it and right. How do you, can you can you spread psychosis like a contagion through society? And I think they have, and I think the serial killer, terrorism, these things, fear, is uh, in a way doing that because you, people lose yes. their critical faculties, and that you can see that as a sort of a psychosis. How people respond to these threats that we're told exist. It's a, it is a certain psychosis. Mass communication. I mean, Christopher for Simpson's book, the. Um, uh, uh, the science of coercion talks about the whole study of mass communication, its refinement, was for mass manipulation. And this goes back to the Princeton Radio Project and War of the Worlds and these things. Right. You know? yeah. um, it's not there to enlighten or educate. And um, uh, a lot of these, these figures, I mean, whether they're, they're put up there to inform us and educate us, they're stage actors, they're, 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 they're spooks, they're OSS agents, like, you know, what, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, people and, have and this another, implicit trust in these in these institutions. It's it's amazing, you know, out of ignorance, I guess, I suppose, you know. Right, and another thing too is you can't overlook uh, the 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 drug aspect of a lot of these killers. So a lot of these guys were drug addicts or are on drugs or were on drugs. Mm-hmm. So you know, like, like Manson, for example, Manson was 
bombed out of his mind on LSD for for all these years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, he, he's not he doesn't even really seem to be present. Like I don't think that that guy, whoever he was originally, that persona is gone. Yeah. Uh, so I think that also suggests again a connection to not just the counterculture and the the '60s lifestyle or something like that, but uh, or the the hate Ashbury lifestyle, the flower child lifestyle. But uh, you know, I think that suggests more is at work, right? I mean, because if you've got guys that have been through these institutions, the prisons, Vacaville mental institutions, the juvenile institutions, and they've been given or on who knows what hallucinogens. Uh, I mean, I, I just, I don't think that you can underestimate the, the intensity of what can be done through the chemical, uh, concoctions that can Mm -hmm. be made. I mean, you can, you know, especially back in the fifties and sixties before people really knew what these drugs were and what they could do. Uh, I mean, I tend to think that there's probably a connection to the UFO phenomenon as well. And this is just a speculation on my part, but, uh, you know, a lot of the experiences that people have on, on LSD or, uh, DMT or, uh, ayahuasca and all these different hallucinogens uh they, t- they they tend to speak like they're talking to aliens too right mm-hmm. like they think they're in, they're they're communicating with the gods or the aliens so uh, it could also be the case i'm just throwing it out there uh, what if a lot of the people who think that they you know interacted with ufos uh, they could have been given drugs uh, and it would be it, it would be very easy to simulate or uh, cause someone to believe that in the midst of a serious drug trip. Yeah. I mean, that would be very easy to do, especially if, you know, you're Farmer Brown or something in the fifties and you have no idea what LSD or ayahuasca is, you know what I mean? And, uh, uh, you know, you're tested on and then, you know, all you'd have to do is like, uh, turn a fan on outside and blink some lights. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Farmer Brown would think that that was uh, a UFO. I mean, literally. Yeah. In the yeah. midst of, and so then he comes on. Oh, comes out. Oh, I've, I've seen I've seen the space visitors. They came to me last night. They, I was out of my body. Had an out of body experience. Yeah, and and all of which all of which lines up with the LSD experience. And it's a great way to. You know, I mean, if you're going to experiment on someone and uh, this. Uh, when you finish, when you finish with him, just create like an alien experience, and he's totally discredited. <laughs> he, mm-hmm. he says, "Hey, guess what happened to me? I was probed by aliens or something." <laughs> you know, then no one's well, gonna believe or, him. Or, 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 uh, and, and you know, Dave mentions in one of the cases, uh, kids that were that were taken uh, had been drugged as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now, if you're a child and you've been drugged or given these crazy drugs, these really intense ones like LSD or something. I mean, there's, I think you would absolutely dissociate and imagine if the person who molested you, uh, I mean, they could be wearing a Mickey Mouse outfit and, uh, you know, you could be saying you were molested. I'm not joking, by the way, you could be no, saying, oh, I, was, I was molested by Mickey Mouse. I was molested by somebody wearing an alien. They, you know, I was molested by aliens. It was just some pervert in a alien suit. Yeah. Uh, and you have their immediate cover. Well, I mean, the, uh... Using drugs to exploit people. I mean, George Hunter White, right? Operation Midnight Climax. Uh, yes. Using prostitutes to then film the Johns, and he's the one that, that famous quote that you know I, you know I, what was that quote of his? I, I raped and murdered or something like. Did it all under the under the cover of the American flag and had a good time doing it. Uh, oh wow! You know, this is a great quote from him. Talking about what he got away with under the cover of national national security. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's was it, yeah they they this was operation they did this operation midnight climax. They kidnapped right. people, drugged them, and filmed them having sex with prostitutes and who knows what else. I mean, here yeah, I was I was a very minor missionary, actually a heretic, but I toiled wholeheartedly in the vineyards because it was fun, fun, fun. Where else could a red blooded American boy lie, kill, cheat, steal, rape? And pillaged with the sanction and the blessing of the hall of the all highest, George Hunter White, who was a counter narcotics officer and also worked with the CIA. 
as part of the early stages of Zimkar Alter mm-hmm. Operation Midnight Climax. And that whole Operation Midnight Climax, they apply, you know, this was a they had these safe houses or in San Francisco. Right. Well, they that just they, apply- that they bought from the mob. They got it from the mob. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you know, the, as far as the as far as the drugs, they went kind of with the uh, Owsley Stanley and the uh, the Grateful Dead was the marketing angle for that uh, of of spreading you know seeding the whole uh, country with LSD, seeing what the reaction would be. And the rock festivals festivals themselves was well, Monterey Pop or Woodstock and. Dave McGowan made a point that 1969 was an interesting year because you had the moon landing in July 20th, 1969. You had the um, Woodstock in August 1969. Also, the Manson killings in 1969. <laughs> it's really all the year these of teams, the PSYOP, isn't it? <laughs> and they're all PSYOPs. You know? And you can see how they're all interrelated, how they react, how they would uh, manipulate the country's emotions one way or the other. I mean, it really is amazing when you see it from the broader picture, you know. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's very difficult to fathom. But then I, but I, but when you read, you know, secret societies and you read program to kill you, you know, you can really get a better picture of how not only is it entirely possible, but that is, uh, you know, the most plausible explanation for all this. I would say, mm-hmm. yeah. So, well, Jay, listen, I want to. Th- I think anything else. I mean, th- you think we covered it or? Any other um, thoughts? I would like to mention uh, the. Uh, the last section, just because it's just so funny, bizarre, and weird to me, and, and I've never heard anybody else mention this, uh, but just the character of Jean Bedel Bocasa, the French oh, puppet, yeah, and who claimed him, proclaimed himself emperor in 1977 of Central African Republic, and what's weird about that? By the way, I went, I went. After I read this, I went and I watched a bunch of clips and documentaries on this guy. <laughs> this guy, what a wacko! But uh, he liked to eat his people. He was victorious over, so he would eat his enemies. Uh, and then he fled to France. So a lot of funny how the, <laughs> the Ayatollah didn't he flee to France too? <laughs> yeah, he hung out in France too for a while. Yeah, was funny on his heels there like, for a while. A lot of people flee to France, but um, yeah, so. You know, we think of cannibalism and these kinds of things as uh, out of the realm of possibility, and nobody does that. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that, again, you get people whacked out on drugs, and they will eat people. That's, yeah. that's my <laughs> concluding salvo there. Oh, there was one interesting case. You might remember, uh, one of the later serial killers of the 90s when it was petering out was this character Joel Rifkin. Uh, you might remember him from the Seinfeld. There's a character named Joe Rifkin on Seinfeld. There's a joke. He shared the name of a serial killer. He, carried, he killed a bunch of prostitutes up in the New York area. Uh, okay. Well, it turns out, um, yeah, he was uh, an American serial killer. In 1994, he was sentenced to 203, 203 years in prison for murder, murders of nine women between 1989 and 1993. He is believed to have killed 17 victims between 1989 and 1993 in New York City and the Long Island, New York area. Mm-hmm. Well, what's interesting is Rifkin often hired prostitutes in Brooklyn and Manhattan. He lived in East Meadow, a suburban town on Long Island. He uh, was a landscaper for uh, William Casey's widow. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, somebody <laughs> somebody brought that up the other day on a yeah. YouTube video I did. Yeah. So, and also, don't forget uh, uh, Dahmer hanging out with uh, no, excuse me, John Wayne Gacy. Well, Dahmer was uh, able to get the his high school class, like the v, VIP yeah. tour of, of the vice president's office. And then, uh, he was going to be an up and up and coming GOP guy. And then it was, uh, John Wayne Gacy hanging out, meeting, uh, Jimmy Carter's wife. That's right. right? Just after having conviction for child, uh, molestation, he was already a convicted sex offender and he got the, he got the, uh, secret service, uh, button, which usually means they're vetted. <laughs> uh, so, which is even more inexplicable. That's just uh, bizarre. You know, yeah. I mean, even more inexplicable. And what's interesting, and you mentioned he got the Dahmer got the tour of Walter Mondo's office. I think that was 1977 and 1978. Yeah. This may not have may not be uh, connected at all. Uh, but if I recall in my research, Walter Mondale sponsored a law, uh, a federal law, which gave bonuses 
for child protective service uh, personnel when they get kids that are, are taken out of homes for abuse reasons, supposedly, uh, and get them adopted. It's, it's a federal law. I forget the name of the law itself. Okay. Mm. There was Georgia State Senator, I think it was was a Deborah Schaefer, who mm -hmm. um, was exposing the corruption in Child Protective Services. That was a, yes, I was remember. Yeah, a child trafficking ring, and part of the um, incentive for these agents that the Child Protective Services induced was that federal law. They get like a five thousand dollar cash bonus for each kid wow. that is removed from that is, that is adopted from foster care, which means that kid first has to be removed from a family and put into foster care. And right. she said there there is a child trafficking ring being operated under the cover of of that of that uh, service, largely funded by the federal law. Walter Mondale, the senator, was a sponsor of that of that bill. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I know don't that. know if that's connected at all to it, but it's interesting to. Well, it makes sense. But yeah. hey, I have a couple of questions. And, Je and sure. of course, Jeffrey Dahmer, right, going who was involved yes. in child sex, rape, murder, and all that stuff, you know. So. Well, I'm, I'm curious I'm what you think about Dave's book. Do you, do you agree with? the thesis that a lot of the, the serial killer stuff is hyped up. I mean, I, I think that, you know, there are uh, contract hits and there are these drug gangs and there, there is MS 13. That's a real mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but I mean, do you think that, do you think, do you think the Dahmer thing, for example, was exaggerated or do you think that it was, uh, you know, the way they told it? That's interesting. Um, you think he had, uh, you know, bodies in the freezer and stuff? Uh, I see no reason to. I see no reason to implicitly trust what the news we reported about that. Mm -hmm. They could all be BS, right? And uh, the idea again that gets into the whole reason why um, that gets into Michael Hoffman's thesis. Uh, uh, these these people may not be as, as spectacular as they, as they think they are, as, or as, right. know, as, as spectacular in the way that is gruesome as we're told. Because, again, we're dealing with the media, which has an interest in sensationalism in and of, its, in and of itself. But right. you get into what Michael Hoffman says about the um, we're all sitting in the pews of the electronic media and we're all taking mm -hmm. this in. And just the reporting is this gruesomeness, gruesomenessness, a gruesomeness, what's that word? The gruesome <laughs> details is going to have that very effect on us. Mm -hmm. You know, this, uh, we'll talk about it and it has that effect, it, that sort of uh, degrading. Uh, of society in general. Um, so, so what would you say, like in the Henry Lee Lucas case, what do you think is the most, what do you think is most likely that went down that they just kind of grouped a whole bunch of unsolved yeah. ones? Around? I don't see one man, you know, being guilty, you know, uh, being able to pull off hundreds of murders without he, he himself getting killed at some point. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy to kill people. I mean, I mean, it's, right. I mean, you can get away with it a few times, but, Killing a human being is difficult. A human being fights back. So it has to be, I mean, a group of people, I mean, a trained killer can do it, I guess. Right. Uh, but, it, you know, again, I think that, I think that that's kind of, uh, I think Henry Lucas there was there to close a lot of, you know, again, to close the books. Um, one thing that Dave McGowan didn't include in the books that occurred afterwards was the uh, the, uh, the D.C. sniper case. John right. Allen yeah. Muhammad. And what, isn't I mean, BTK after the book, too? Yeah, after the book as well. He talks about it because. Right. Uh, um, in the interview, yeah. Yeah, in the interview, but the I'm because I was I, I'm in the area where the DC sniper was. was I'm mean, affected. There's a lady killed just down the street from my brother's house. Right uh, now, the, when, there were news stories that he that he left the death card, which is the special forces card. Yeah. Do you recall that? Yeah, I remember that, and then also the fact that uh, the police chief out in uh, uh, Montgomery County, Moose, um, apparently was at the same base as John Allen Muhammad out in Oregon. Huh. And that's and this weird. Remember that weird message that he left for him, that cryptic message. Or uh -huh. And on the phone, he called. He comes out in front of the police station. And le weird leaves us. It was almost like it's triggering. And the next day, I think he's caught in the um, sleeping in the car or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Out on two seventy. Now, was there ever a, a reasoning for why he was doing that? They concocted some sort of idea where he was. Going out, he was going to Motive. go after his wife and then create a bunch of murders to cover it up, which goes in that haystacking uh, okay. thesis. But they think he again. What the media went and said, well, the you know they're probably responsible for these murders too. They actually did that. They share like all these different murders in different states. How John Allen Muhammad is probably responsible for those murders as well.
But he he himself had some unexplained income. He traveled. Kids went yeah. to private school. He went on ski trips. Went to the went to the went to the uh, Caribbean several times. Oh, he's probably a contract killer. Yeah, so that's what it sounds like. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's you know, given the time that happened, it was the fall of two thousand two, a year after nine eleven. Uh, and I remember right. at the time thinking, "What the heck's going on?" And then these weird things. With <laughs> actually, were, they actually said that <clears throat> look for a white panel van. Yeah, I remember that. Now. If you drive on the highways around here, I think every tenth car is a white panel van. <laughs> What's the? I mean, so that just makes everybody freak out. Freak out, yeah. And so and that gets into this whole idea of you know, whole notion of the serial killers. I remember joking at the time. <laughs> it was like getting gasoline, pulling people like ducking. I make, my, make my wife go out and pump the gas. <laughs> <laughs> hey, honey, can you get it this time? <laughs> yeah, I want to live. Yeah, but, uh, what, and. <laughs> And uh, it's just as kind of silly as the terrorist story, right? The, the yeah, because the, your, your chances of being a victim, right. I mean, you're more likely getting hit by a car or getting in a car accident or getting sniped. But again, that's the psychological effect. And of course, yeah. within those killings was this one lady, I think her name was Barbara Franklin, who was an FBI uh, uh, agent who oh, was wow. somehow involved in the weapons of mass destruction cover-up or something. Okay. Uh, and she was gunned down outside of Home Depot. Uh, so that's an interesting case there. But um, again, it's one of the other things. If you look at all these serial killers, the idea of you being killed by a serial killer, the odds. You know, oh really, yeah, right. You better, you know, more, more likely get struck by lightning. And but, but again, the psychological effect. Um, I think David Berkowitz, uh, the son of Sam, even the official narrative: six, vic- six, eight victims, six fatalities. And how many, how many homicides are there, are there in New York City every year? You know? Yeah, exactly. Another thing too, I remember I was reading some of the pop stuff like Psychology Today articles a few years ago about, quote, serial killers. And, you, you know, it's it's very uh, PC, and it's like oh, the serial killer is a middle-aged white male who wears the the wire rim glasses, and he's, you know, yeah, yeah. very, very neat. He tucks his shirt in and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I'm sitting here thinking, well, actually, you can go look it up, just the mainstream story at least. There's quite a few uh, female serial killers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That are never talked about, but there are that they, they do exist. Um, there are also black guys who were serial killers that are not talked about. Mm-hmm. So actually, that the I would say that the uh, there are you know uh, Latino killers who are pretty vicious, especially MS13 gang types. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the idea that this is like the white male, middle aged white male, is the serial killer is pretty ludicrous. Uh, and I also tend to argue too that. I think women who have no compunction and have had, you know, five abortions, I don't see why that's not a serial killer either. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, that goes back to what the Dave McGowan said about the whole idea of FBI profiling. That's there to mislead the public about what the serial killer is. Meaning there's aren't these organic guys that go out and, you know, they have this obsession and they're, you know, like in Silence of the Lambs was going after fat <laughs> like, chicks like or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like uh, Clarice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's hunting yeah. down, you know, Doctor Lecter? Yeah, right. The myth is they're, they're actually on a mission, and it's the same way in Phoenix, where yeah, they're doing a lot of killing, but there's a reason for it, and they may they may just they may enjoy it, like in Phoenix, uh, but there's they're, they're, they're they have controllers, and the same thing you talk about these MS13 guys, uh, where the, yeah, there's a cult element to it, mm-hmm. uh, because that's how you organize, uh, hey, that's how you motivate motivate and control people. Right. Um, but they have handlers, and they're, and they're, they're murdering for a reason. Right? Yes. They're murdering, murdering for a reason. Well, a lot of the black crime, the soaring black crime rates of the 1960s, uh, at first glance, that may have appeared to be, uh, you know, um, disorganized or uh, or sporadic. Uh, but as it turns out, that a lot of these these gang black gangs were being funded by the by the federal government through the community block grants and. Um, I believe it was revealed in the uh, church committee hearings uh, in the 1970s that Sergeant Shriver, when he ran the the Office of Economic, Economic Opportunity, uh, gave a, close to a million dollars to this group called the Blackstone Rangers, a criminal gang in Chicago, I think. And what the function of those groups was to more or less just to go out, create mayhem, create, create a lot of crime, uh, to chase out the whites. And this was all part of this... Uh, 
a program to destroy the ethnic neighborhoods, the white ethnic neighborhoods, and uh, encourage the creation, the diaspora into um, into suburbia. Um, uh, so this is all part of a sort of a strategy, tension, or destabilization. Um, you, you mentioned that movie Sicario, right? Um, that's where that James Brolin character uh, goes. He tells the, uh, the lady FBI agent that they're just down there, you know, sh- you know, shaking some trees, stirring up trouble to see what happens. Of course, what that really means on the ground is they're going in there, creating uh, shootouts on the streets, making life a living hell for the inhabitants down there in Mexico, in, you know, near Juarez, and you know, they, they could care less. You know, um, uh, that's the same way that perhaps uh, criminal activities such as drug drug dealing, importation of drugs in certain neighborhoods here in the United States it could be all part of a sort of a gentrification program. You know, that's 20 years in the offing. Right, yeah, that's kind of what uh, Catherine Austin Fitz has talked yeah. about, right? and it's the same thing with... Um, uh, and that was, I mean, that, that, my point is that this was, this was, <laughs> this type of strategy was was uh, documented and proven in the '60s with the Blackstone Rangers. You've mentioned uh, how the uh, the uh, the Black Panthers were radicalized, mm-hmm. and then yeah, taken, Ri- yeah. Richard Aoki, yeah, yeah, and then taken out when they murdered Freddie Hampton because they got out of control. They've they've done their job. The shelf life had expired, and then they right. take them out. And when they're taken out, they're used as propaganda for the police state. Exactly. Uh, in the 1970s, you had the Simulines Liberation Army, right, which grew out of Vacaville yes. and Colton Westbrook. Uh, and, and and that that with Charles Whitmore leads to the creation of the SWAT team and federalization of local police. Federalization of the police force. Yeah, that whole shootout, which seems which is probably staged. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some question about Weatherman, right? About the growing out of SDS yeah. and why right. Billy Ayers was never, free, you know, what guilty as hell, free as a bird was his quote. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, the government. You know, technicality, we can't convict him, and that's his statement. Of course, you know, he's he's lived a charmed existence. You know. Right, with, with a whole bunch of foundation funding mm-hmm. behind his stuff. So yeah. So um, I mean, uh, the serial uh, the, the serial killer uh, thesis fits right into this. It's the whole destabilization and then uh, tr- psychological warfare uh, bundled in with the maybe uh, targeted killings and drug running and <laughs> mm-hmm. you know it's uh, it's what they do. I, I, a part of understanding this, I think, is is probably it goes back to um, maybe go back to maybe Doug Valentine's book in the Phoenix Program and thinking how would that be applied domestically, and that's just how it would be applied domestically here, and how it's an influence domestic policy with the Department of Homeland Security, the fusion centers, the idea of um, you know ma- manipulating the media, these things, how again how it's then how it's projected through these movies through electronic media and promoted in your your question regarding are some of these stories exaggerated, the, gruesome, you know, the gruesome details, are they presented as, you know, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's no reason to even to, you know, you know, to assume that that's even correct. It's just, it just goes, it's for our consumption, you know. Good right, point. yeah, yeah, it's it's very Hollywood, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And it's like that, and it's like, you know, like the serial killer, you know, with the heads propped up <laughs> by the dining room Yeah, table. like uh, at the end of Seven where... The, yeah. The, you know, who is it? Brad, Brad Pitt sees his girlfriend's head or something. Yeah, it's decapitated wife's head or you know, decapitated yeah. her white yeah, in the in the box there and all that. So, yeah. So, well, listen. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. It was a great talk, Jay. I really yeah. enjoyed it. I mean, uh, your analysis was, was a good uh, program to kill. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, no, I think that that's good. Um, you, I mean, there, there could be a whole probably two I separate. Yeah. There could be a whole separate t- discussion of uh, secret societies and psychological warfare, but yeah, b- both of the books dovetail well. Mm-hmm. Again, the serial killer phenomenon it tends to coincide with the psychological warfare of the post-war era, the sort of, uh, well, the Vietnam War, the economic problems, the trauma, the societal uh, destabilization, the, the whole thing with society seemed to be turning upside down, and uh, you know, the old rules didn't apply anymore, families were breaking up, and the uh, high, you know increasing divorce rate, the... Uh, yeah, all this stuff. Uh, it's all part of it. It was all part of it. And you see it in the, in in that context. Um, and I think it's important to point out too that it seems to be consistent, fa- logical phases and steps. Mm-hmm. So, like I was saying at the beginning, in the pop culture, you get business plans or phases or steps of what's considered revolution and counter-establishment. 
you know, back then it was smoking dope and listening to the doors and sleeping around free love. Now it's fight uh, the establishment patriarchy's genders that they've mm-hmm. imposed on you. Yeah. That's the f- phases of the degradation. And you couldn't and, get, and, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. As, w- as well as uh, passing from, oh, uh, the 60s are a revolution against, uh, you know, the 1940s and 50s corporate man and the, you know, the company man. And we're mm-hmm. going to be free from all that and we're going to be anti-war. And then it becomes... Uh, the serial killer phase, right? And then it becomes the war on terror phase, right? Mm-hmm. So well, there's there's no more uh, serial killers, but there's all the terrorists everywhere. And then there's also the, the health the health scares, like a, the AIDS crisis, AIDS hysteria. Oh, yeah, that's a great one, which, which is mentioned as an actual psychological war preparation. Yes, life. yeah, for that very purpose, to further degrade society, the hypersexualized mm-hmm. society, which is a big part of this, by the way, because the hypersexualization, you get the... Uh, well, you get the violence. Uh, you get the serial killer. Sexual sex is a big thing with the serial killer. All, all yeah, it says yeah. a sex death cult is yeah. a good way to put it. You know. And it's funny how you remove sex from procreation, you immediately start to uh, veer it towards becomes, it becomes connected to death. Death. Yeah. <laughs> right. The le petit mort, the little death. Yeah. As the French term for organism is. That's interesting. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. Wow. Okay, well, Jay, uh, listen, I kept you a long time. I want to thank you. I know you've been very busy, lady, and you've been very generous with your time. I'm really appreciative of it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you, you'll be headed out soon back to do some more filming, so I wish you wish you safe travels. Appreciate that. And uh, uh, we'll talk later on, maybe uh, uh, later in the spring or early in the summer, see whatever comes up.